several, and we've, we've discussed about the world that's taking place, the world that's going on around us. We've discussed a little bit about the state. It's made up of sinful people. There is poverty in the world, and there are several categories of poverty. There is wars. There is natural disasters going on. And then we looked at some information. We talked about some things that, that uh, is related to suffering that's unique to believers, and that's either discipline from the Lord or opposition to our message. We're not Israel, so there's no political motive necessarily for going after believers because we're not a political entity. We're not Israel. We're not a nation kind of idea. When they go after believers, they're going after the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going after the things that we believe, the things that we hold. And then we began to, to look at the topic of biblical correctness. What is a proper view of war and hell and curses? And we're in that, we're in that discussion, we're in that talk now. Once we leave war, hell, and curses, which I, I believe we will tonight, we'll get into an area of illness, death, and bereavement. And what we should think about that, what the world at large thinks about that, and perhaps it will reorient us a bit and uh, bring us back around to a, a proper understanding of death, for example, and how we should view that death. But in this area of biblical correctness, war, hell, and, and curses, remember we, the last time we were together, we, we began to look at what the world's reaction, what the protest is from the world in regards to these matters. And then we talked about, uh, for example, we read Deuteronomy chapter 20, verses 10 through 18, a passage that talks about going in and wiping out whole people groups. So this was what God called Israel to do, to wipe out whole people groups. This is the God who loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son. But there was a point in, in history when, there, when people groups needed to be wiped out because of their gross conduct and the degree of their debauchery and their immorality, God decided that they do not deserve to live, they should not live, they should not be an influence on anyone, and so the Lord used the tool, whatever tools he used, to make them go away forever. Now, the world rages against that, and the world doesn't like that, and the world calls that, well, that's not the God that I love, and that's not the God that I know, but it is the biblical God, so we looked at last week the, the protest from the world and the perception, remember, the perception of the problem. And the problem is ours, not God's. The problem is we have a sense of fairness that we have adopted and we have a sense of what is right and wrong that we have adopted through whatever means, whatever source we got this from. The problem is, is that source that we obtained all of this, whether it was the source of advertising or the source of commercial or whatever it was, it's not the biblical view. But the world protests. And so the problem is ours, not God's. And we talked about that. Um, we must, in fact, I said that we, we must dare to ask ourselves if our own moral sensibilities have somehow been misdirected, misfocused. Is it possible that even our severest problems about these forms of suffering owe more to the pluralism of our age than to any um, superiority of moral judgment on our part? Is it possible that part, at least, of our horror and our thoughts of hell and war and all these things owe something to our inability or refusal to look at sin from God's perspective? Sin... Seen from God's perspective, not, I wouldn't say welcomes, but understands completely when there is war and when there is sin, sinful acts, and when there is hell. Was when, because when we properly understand sin, in contrast to God's holiness, there's going to be a reaction, there's going to be a clash. And the clash is, God is going to react to sinfulness with whatever means that he decides. At one time, he, he killed the whole planet except for eight people. Sin had evidently achieved that level of debauchery so that the Lord sent a flood and did away with everybody and almost started over from scratch, so to speak. 
So why is it that we are comfortable with our evangelical cliches about God loving the sinner but hating the sin when the first 50 Psalms alone, there are 14 passages where God is explicitly said to hate the sinner or to be angry with the sin or something of that nature? Now, I'm not suggesting uh, at all that there is no truth in, at all in this cliche. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I am suggesting, and, and I'm not suggesting that we would be justified in going out and today and committing genocide. That's, that's not. God called for that at one time, and therefore he's calling to us to that again. No, he's not. Not at all. We work, we work through this. One of the fundamental differences we noted about the new covenant is the fact that the, the location of the people of God under the covenant that we live no longer constitutes a nation. And we remember we talked about that. We're, when people react to us, they're not reacting to a political movement or a nation. They're reacting to the church of Jesus Christ. They're reacting to what we teach. So that is, uh, that is the rage or, or the perception of the problem. And the problem is not... God's, the problem is ours. A second protest from the world, a second response from the world is a, is a rhetoric of outrage. Um, take, for instance, Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 20, in verses 14 through 18, Jeremiah 20, 14 through 18, it says this, Cursed be the day when I was born. Let the day not be blessed when my mother bore me. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father, saying, A baby has been born to you, and made him very happy. But let that man be like the cities which the Lord overthrew without relenting. And let him hear an outcry in the morning, and a shout of alarm at noon, because he did not kill me before birth, so that my mother would have been my grave, and her womb ever pregnant. Why did I ever come from the womb to look on trouble and sorrow so that my days have been spent in shame? Wow. Look at that passage. Take, for instance, what Jeremiah says there. The general thrust of those passages is clear. Jeremiah is so miserable that he wishes he were dead or better yet that he'd never been born. But does that mean that he's placing a well-considered curse on the head of uh, of everybody um, who is unblessed, I guess, or not blessed enough to have, to have news that you, you, you have a son or you have a daughter. Does Jeremiah really want his mother to be forever pregnant? To, to cut the message from the text on the ground that it is irresponsible would be a great loss for us because the vividness of the outrage would be diluted were it replaced by a, a bland... Uh, statements such as Jeremiah is deeply disturbed. I mean, all of those verses could be replaced by Jeremiah is deeply disturbed, but then we miss the impact of what Jeremiah is trying to communicate. Or Jeremiah wishes he had never been born. What Jeremiah does here is he makes us feel the heart or the heat of his indignation. So, um, in this case, cautious literalism could, could not achieve so much. Jeremiah wishes he'd never been born. Or you can read it in verses 14 through 18 the way that he said it. So Jeremiah makes us feel the heat of his indignation. He makes us feel what he is really feeling by saying the words that he does. So it follows that we must ask whether some of the counsel or excuse me, some of the cursed and some of the evil language in the Psalms is in the same way not the language of, of considered address, but the rhetoric of outrage. And you see that in the Psalms. The Psalms sometimes are wordy. And it is David or the writer of the Psalms going on about their condition and their situation to make the reader, to express their feelings and make the reader understand as fully as they can what they're going through. And related to this is how the cries of outrage fit into the larger context of the man and his message. For example, uh, Psalm 74, 20. 
Psalm 74, 20. Thin pages. There we go. Psalmist writes, Consider the covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of the inhabitants of violence. Consider the dark places. Related to, to this, as, as we mentioned just a moment ago, Jeremiah was sometimes gently rebu rebuked by our Lord, we know that, for his understandable bitter self-pity. Uh, but David was not uh, permitted to build the temple because, like his son Solomon, he was a warrior who shed blood, according to 1 Chronicles 28. So he was not allowed to do that because of his, because of his actions. The anticipation of, of the consummation of history, when people will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, when nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train any more for war in Isaiah 2.4, provides ample evidence that war is not treated as a neutral thing um, and it's, it's not intrinsically a good thing either. Even though it takes place in this world in which we live, it's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, war, war cries or cries of vengeance and mass deaths are themselves to be set against the backdrop of the fallen world where evil must be restrained, where evil inflicted uh, invokes cries of outrage, of despair, uh, calls, of, for, calls for justice, calls for uh, men to exact justice upon these evils that take place. So while there is the rhetoric of outrage, there must be among believers an understanding that these things happen in a fallen world. Though we don't have to like them, and though we should do whatever we can to alleviate them, to help people, to not allow this to happen. Nevertheless, it should not throw us into open and unrelenting despair because this is the world we live in. This is the world that's tainted by sin, that will remain tainted by sin until the millennium comes and all things are made new again. And then finally, the heaven, new heavens and the new earth as well. And there's also the influence of the Old Covenant as another protest from the world about the things that are going on. And under the Old Covenant, the, the covenant that God made with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai through the servant Moses, the, the center of activity of the people of God was a nation. And other nations enjoyed God's forbearance and blessings. And sometimes they enjoy even His forgiveness, such as Nineveh in the time of Jonah. But Israel was a covenant people of God, and Israel was a nation. And in time, they, of course, they split, and they became two nations. And further, along, uh, although God was Israel's king, he operated, God operated through mediators, and his vassal king in the, in the line of David. And his priests were from the tribe of Levi, and the prophets were raised up on the occasions, and they would preach and call the people back to obedience. That was their role. Most of their role was calling the people back to obedience. Not a great deal of their role was prophesying things to come in the future. Most of their role was, uh, was reprimanding Israel and calling a king, for example, back to obey and, uh, obedience to the Mosaic law. But these people represented uh, they, they represented the people to God, and they represented God to the people. And when these people sinned, they brought down the people with them. And when they were courageous and righteous, in some measure they reformed the people for whom they were responsible. That's what happens in a, a theocratic nation like Israel. Because the people constituted a nation, it was impossible to, and this is key to understanding some of the things, I think, in the Old Testament, because the people of God constituted a nation, it was impossible to disassociate God's blessings on the people from the welfare of the nation or God's judgment of the people from the decline of the nation or the spiritual and moral purity of the people from the religious integrity of the nation. That means 
that the easy distinctions that we make between civil and religious, between political and moral, could not possibly exist in Israel. Because God was king over all of it. Not just the spiritual part, everything. They were all intertwined. The covenant people constituted a nation. The nation was a theocracy. Its fundamental laws were God's laws. Its officers were God's appointees. Ideally, therefore, the political decisions, the court decisions, legislative decisions, all should have reflected the mind of God and this in a political context. That's the, that's the old covenant. We're, of course, not like that. Uh, not like that at all. So when judicial uh, punishment was being meted out, in theory at least, it was punishment from God himself. If these kings were reflecting the will of God in, what, in everything that they did. And our system is set up on the same kind of premise that you have a judge and you have a jury and you have, you have to have witnesses. All of these things, much, much of our Constitution is set up uh, based on these principles that you see in the Old Testament. Some even went so far as to say that the, the America is the new Israel. Well, we're certainly not the new Israel. Some believe that and that's why they came over here. But they, uh, they quickly found out it was not the new Israel. And it was, that was true also of Israel's wars. Israel's enemies were God's enemies. Israel was told when there was, uh, excuse me, Israel was told when and where she was allowed to fight. Remember? Shall we go up and fight against these people? God would say, go up, I shall, deli I shall del deliver them to your hands. Shall we go do this? And the Lord would say either directly or he would send his high priest or prophet. The Lord has answered your prayer, go and do Sometimes the prophet was wrong. David said, I'm going to build a house. Nathan said, do all that the Lord has laid in your heart. Well, later, Nathan got a dream, was in a dream. God told him, no, um, David is not going to build a house. So the prophet got it wrong at that time. God told, uh, regarding the war, God told them where to go and who to fight and much of the destruction that took place as Israel entered the promised land was understood to be a terrible judgment on the wickedness of the people already living there. The, the rank idolatry had been compounded with the fertility cult religion that is people sleeping with cult priests and priestesses to encourage the gods uh, in hope of bringing fruitfulness to the land and home, even child sacrifice uh, to the god Molech. All of these things were taking place. So if, if God felt it was necessary to curb the evil of the world by obliterating most of the human race at the time of the flood, and he did, and if by the same powerful word that affected uh, that judgment, the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment, and destruction for, of the ungodly in 2 Peter 3, 7, it should, um, should it be surprising that God would inflict through his covenant people punishments of a similar sort, but on a much smaller scale? In other words, in light of 2 Peter 3, 7, the present heavens and the earth are reserved for fire. When we look back into the Old Testament to see what's going on, should it surprise us on a smaller scale that God would rid the world of Moral disease. That's, that's the old covenant. By the same token, when the best of Israel's kings saw themselves surrounded by foes, by enemies, they could not possibly think in merely military or political categories because the king was God's son. The king was God's vassal. His cause was just because it was God's cause. That's how close it was. It was entirely right that the king should turn to God and plead his calls and cry for justice. And if justice was forthcoming, then under the, under the establishment, under the, the rules established there by the old covenant, justice was necessary. It had, uh, 
national, political, and sometimes military overtones. That's the difference between us, one of the differences between us as a church. We're a spiritual organism, not a nation. We don't have codified laws as in the Mosaic law. But if we did, we would be functioning. If we did, you should oppose every president who is unrighteous. But we're not. The president of the United States is not a religious office. It's not. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not. And so there are, because of that, um, people sometimes try to impose, well, they're not a righteous person. Well, it's not a righteous seat. It's not a righteous position. It's not a righteous should they be righteous? Yes, we would want to see that righteousness in every position so that they have the influence and the righteousness can pour out from their judgment seat, so to speak, and bless the people. But there's no government on earth existing today that's part of a theocracy where God puts his king over the people. None of that exists today. So we may ask ourselves if God still works in similar fashion today. And the answer is ambiguous. What do I mean by that? On the one hand, the answer must be no. The, the center of activity of God's people in the new covenant, us, is not a nation. And every attempt to establish a unified Christian nation has not only been misconceived, but has resulted in disastrous failure. You look at John Calvin tried to bring the millennial kingdom in. Other people have tried to establish a millennial kingdom in their time, and they have all met with disaster. You cannot do what God has not called us to do, what God has not given us the resources to do. So every attempt to establish a unified Christian nation has not only been misconceived, but has resulted in, in disastrous failure. So does that mean we give up? Of course not. Or maybe we need to reorient ourselves. So, on the other hand, God is still the God of all the nations, acknowledged or not. Wars can be looked at from a Christian perspective in several ways. But one of those, one of the, the ways is the, percept, or the perspective of judgment. And I don't mean to suggest that there are no discernible rights and wrongs, for example, in the Second World War. There can be little doubt that Germany started it for all the wrong reasons. But we remember Habakkuk, remember? Sometimes a more wicked nation is used by God to punish another nation, less wicked perhaps, but whose time for judgment in God's providence has arrived. When we read the record of the incredibly stupid decisions made by the British Parliament and the French Cabinet in the seven-year period leading up to the war, when we see those, we wonder if God was blinding the eyes of some to bring about the judgment that actually fell. When you look at things today, and you have the, the young female senator from New York who's absolutely foolish, and yet... Her popularity is that she's the most popular as far as Twitter goes. She's the most popular Democrat, and she's an absolute idiot when it comes to economics. I mean, record this, absolute idiot when it comes to, and she has a degree in economics. You wonder if God was blinding the eyes of some to bring about the judgment that actually fell. It's just like, <whistles> off we go. And everybody's happy to do the same thing. Now, we must always be leery of claims that providence can be read in hindsight like, um, like an old-fashioned morality play. Still, most of us have swung too far the other way. We think along the... Uh, we think along such naturalistic lines that we allow little room for God. We've, we have certainly not taken to heart the biblical portrait of a God of justice who holds all to account both individuals and nations and who sovereignly works out 
His purposes, sometimes behind the scenes in mysterious providence that uses an evil uh, machine's evil people, the ideas of other people to raise up and put down entire nations and peoples. So all of this, this suggests that the most important response to the problem of holy wars in the Old Testament is not arrogant self-righteousness and shocked Uh, condescending horror but brokenness because the Lord may blind the the eyes of some to bring about judgment even in our own day and from there we go to the teaching on hell and you've heard people already I'm sure in your lifetime Jesus is a Jesus is a is a God of love he is he never did this he he didn't cause war he didn't call anybody to go to war as the Old Testament God did, but Jesus is the New Testament God and He's kind and gentle. Well, did you know that Jesus spoke about hell more than, more than any other New Testament writer or character? So if there's any subject that few Christians like to think about, hell is it. We don't like generally to think about hell. Yet it is our Lord, more than any other person in the New Testament, who gives us the most graphic details about hell. He speaks, or that is Jesus Christ, he speaks of a fiery place, a fiery furnace, a place where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth, of people crying out for a drop of water to cool their tongues, a place of darkness, some place that's outside and away from the bliss enjoyed by God's people. And he does not hesitate to draw the absolute distinction. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Clearly there are two different places. One's eternal life, one's eternal punishment. They're both eternal. This word eternal is used in both cases. It's not as though that one goes to one place and you're annihilated and you no longer exist, but the others are not annihilated and they live forever. Both live forever. Both are eternal. Our Lord can speak of the resurrection of the just and of the unjust and of the evil rising to be condemned in John chapter 5 and verses 28 and 29. And it is our Lord who insists that the, the, the chasm, the distance between these two, are, uh, who are in, uh, the distance between those who are in torment and those who are in Abraham's bosoms, is fixed and uncrossable. You cannot go. Once you die and destiny is set, you cannot cross over. So there's no post-mortem evangelization going on. This was taught by our Lord. This is gentle and compassionate Jesus. Some people think, and he is gentle and he is compassionate. And many of these images are drawn from the parables. And even if we assume that the language is metaphorical, it's metaphorical language that has a referent. The referent is the truth. There is a place called hell, called Hades. There is a place called heaven. And if the metaphors are doing their job, they are invoking images of a horrible existence. And the shocking language that our Lord uses is confirmed elsewhere in the New Testament. And there are several perspectives Uh, that may help us come to terms with with the text. And let's talk about some of those. First of all, on the whole, our Lord himself is not shocked by the existence of hell, but by the hardness of people's hearts. Let's reorient ourselves and get away from the, the kind and gentle Jesus who would never speak of hell and never do anything of this nature that we think is unfair and and not right. Let's remind ourselves, first of all, that Jesus himself is not shocked by the existence of hell, but by the hardness of people's hearts. That may tell us what we need to, uh, that may tell us that we need to wrestle much more diligently with how God looks at sin and the moral offensiveness of the sin that he sees. Perhaps we don't see it as clearly for what it is as he does, and we need to reorient ourselves rather than creating a God that's oriented toward how we see things. Second of all, there's no hint in the Bible that there is any repentance in hell. 
I like the rich man in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16. There may be a cry for relief or even a plea that the surviving brothers be warned, but there is no hint of repentance. There is one passage, in fact, there is one passage that suggests the opposite. Perhaps then we should think of hell as a place where people continue to rebel, continue to insist on their own way, continue the structures, the prejudice, the hate, the continuing to defy the living God. That's where they go and that's what they do. And as they continue to defy God, so the Lord continues to punish them and the cycle goes on and on and on. After all, it is arguable that that is, that is rather uh, analogous to what goes on in the Old Testament and today. Isaiah 42, 24. Now Isaiah 42, verse 24. Who gave Jacob up for spoil and Israel to plunders? Was it not the Lord against whom we have sinned and whose ways they were not willing to walk and whose laws they did not obey? So he poured out on him the heat of his anger and the fierceness of battle. And it set him aflame all around, yet he did not recognize it. And it burned him, but he paid no attention. Wow. This is what the Lord does. In recent years, perhaps you know this, several, several scholars, evangelical scholars, have publicly said in, in, in written statements uh, their view that hell may not exist forever. But uh, or hell may exist forever, but there will never be people in it forever. People annihilationism. It's not quite as popular as it was a few years ago, but there are some notable men that suggested this or left the door open, so to speak, for this understanding. Um, they would say, although punishments may differ, eventually every resident will be destroyed, will be annihilated. The idea of eternal punishment, they say, is not biblical. And this interpretation, they suggest, eliminates a great moral problem. No one is punished eternally for finite temporal sins. That's their thinking. That's the way their thinking goes. Well, of course, that's not true because that's, that stems from a misunderstanding of the holiness of God and the contrasting sin, what it is. It is so sinful it is so dark it is so black it is so wrong in light of a holy god that it merits this kind of reaction by god and there's no as we read earlier there's no hint that in hell there's ever a one person who ever wants to repent they miss, may wish to warn brothers they they may wish to have some relief but never repent never turn never stop doing what they're doing. Are any of us equipped to assess what is an appropriate punishment for defiance of the holy and sovereign God? He's the one who stated, this is the, defi this is the punishment for defiance against me. Who are we to suggest another kind of punishment or less severe punishment? But that's, that's what some have done, some have tried to do. Third, we must always remember that the Bible does not present us with a God who chances upon neutral men and women and arbitrarily consigns some to heaven and some to hell. He takes guilty men and women, all of whom deserve his wrath, and in his great mercy and love, he saves vast numbers of them. Had he saved only one, it would have been an act of grace. That he saves a vast host, affirms still more unmistakably the uncharted reaches of his grace. From a biblical perspective, hell stands as a horrible witness to human defiance of the great grace of our God. You see, 
if you turn things around and you start looking at God as being unfair and hell is not an appropriate punishment for a finite kind of sin, then your theology starts, your theology starts tailspinning into something that's, that's going to be a gross, you're going to birth some gross idea of something somewhere. But from the biblical perspective, hell stands as a horrible witness to human defiance in the face of great grace. And last, fourth, perhaps the most important, the God of the Bible is not unmoved by our suffering. He is slow to anger. He is abundant in mercy. The Jesus who delivers this, the terrible woes to the religious hypocrites in Matthew 23 ends up weeping over the city of Jerusalem. Remember 23, the very end of chapter 23. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stones those who were sent to you. How often I would have longed, I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. So this is the God who does all of these things as a response to sin, as a response to gross moral lifestyles, but he's also a God that is not unmoved by our suffering. He is moved by our suffering. He is slow to anger and he is abundant in mercy. Um, let me see. I think that's um, I think that's all of this aspect, hell curses that I want to talk about tonight. What time is it? Okay. Can we can we talk for just a few minutes about illness, death, and bereavement to get some biblical input? Stimulate, uh, stimulate our thoughts in some ways here regarding this matter and there's, there's much more that we could be able to say about it in the coming weeks. Now you and I, we've all lived here in this world and we live long enough, we will be bereaved. And we live long enough, we will all die. In a fallen world, these points are immutable. In other words, they're unchanging. Nothing changes this. The only thing that would change living long enough and we eventually will die is if God calls us home like he did Enoch or Elijah. They didn't see death. Apart from that happening and the rapture, apart from those things happening, we will all, we will all die. It's a result of sin. It should not surprise us. It should not keep, keep us, catch us off guard. These points are immutable, and yet grief and pain tend to always catch us unawares. It does. I don't know if that's because we prayed to God that this would not happen. We prayed to God that our children would be protected. We prayed that the surgery would go well, and when it didn't go well, are we shocked because God did not answer our prayer? Is that, is that our reaction? Why does it catch us unawares? Why does it still shock us? We know we are, we are not immune, but there is, there is a suppressed hope that pretends that we are immune. You know, as a pastor, I hear these things, and I, I, think, I, I think I told Gene week or a couple of weeks ago you know one of these days when we get a call and something happened one of these days it's going to be me one of these days it's going to be guess what I have cancer rather than me hearing it on the phone pastor so and so happened this happened it's going to be me saying I have cancer I'm not immune I'm going to be one of them one day probably and it's just kind of sobering you start thinking about that we know we're not immune, but there is a suppressed hope that pretends that we are immune. And when our child dies or our spouse, when we see a loved one wasting away from a painful disease or observe a, a brilliant and courteous mind 
disintegrating before our eyes, when, when we ourselves suddenly face the most appalling pain or, or incapacity with no prospect of relief, then our pretensions rush, toward, rush forward in another form. Why is God doing this? We, we know our dear Louise, why? Why, is God, why did God do this? Why could they not correct this? It is true that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, Romans eight twenty eight. But it is quite obvious that this should not be quoted to the couple that has just lost their child in a road accident. If they knew the Lord well, then perhaps with time, they themselves will cite this verse with renewed faith and understanding. But it should not be thrust at them in the wrong way or at the wrong time or without tears because it will come across as a bit bit of cheap ritual. It's not the way to comfort people. To establish Christian structures of thought that are already givens before pain and bereavement strike, we should, as best we can, understand who we are in this world, who God is, and the things that happen in this world because of sin. So, with that kind of introduction... Talk, let's go into a little, bit of, a little bit of talk of sin, sickness, and death, if we can, just for a few minutes. Let me see any notes that I have here. Okay. All righty. We, we, we have seen that suffering, all suffering, is tied to sin. We're, we're convinced of that. When my dad got cancer, I, I just, I hate, it just made me hate sin all the more. Because, because of sin, we have cancer. So we, we've all seen how all suffering is tied to sin. If there had been no sin, there would be no death, there would be no illness. But the connections need to be spelled out precisely. First of all, First, death must be seen not as the supreme instance of a cosmic lack of fairness, but as God's well-considered sentence on our sin. Death, not illness necessarily, but death, must be seen not as the supreme instance of cosmic lack of fairness, God is not a killjoy, so to speak, but as God's well-considered sentence against our sin. Our, uh, against our sin. This is not... What the bereaved, of course, wants to hear. But this first point is so central to the Bible's perspective that we must not evade it or shove it to the periphery of our thought. Death is no accident. It is God's doing. The day in which you eat of this, you will surely die. And spiritually, they died instantly, just like that. There was a separation between them and God. And in time... The erosion of sin took its toll and they died. It is God's doing. In Psalm 90, Psalm 90 in verses 3 through 6. You turn man back into dust and say, return, O children of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes by or as a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood. They fell asleep. In the morning they are like grass which sprouts anew. In the morning it flourishes and sprouts anew. Toward evening it fades and withers away. Death is no accident. And Moses wrote this and very bold in writing this. But this activity of God is not merely a reflection of the distance between God and us, the infinite and the finite, between the transit and the limited. Death is not here thought of as the 
God's way of toying with us creatures. That's not what he's doing. And he goes on to say in verses 7 through 11 that we are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Moses continues. This side of this slide, this perennial slide toward death is nothing other than the outworking of God's judicial sentence. How do we see death and what is it? The slide toward death is nothing other than the outworking of God's judicial sentence. What is that sentence? When you eat of it, you certainly will die. Genesis 2.17. It is always true that the wages of sin is death. But why death? Could there not have been some other punishment? Death is God's limit on creatures whose sin is that they want to be God's. You desire to be like me. Satan tried to convince you that I was lying to you and I tricked you and I wanted to keep you in a box because I was jealous. I didn't want anybody to be like me. You bought into it. Death is God's limit on creatures whose sin is that they want to be God's. Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5. The true God is holy, he is unique, he cannot by his very nature tolerate those who try to relativize, relative, relativize, that's it, who try to relativize him. We are not gods and by death we learn that we are only human. Our pretensions are destroyed, we are cut off, we are reminded that we are but mortal, death does. You know, I never thought in my whole life that my grandmother and granddad would ever go away. Mama and Papa. Uh, I, had to, I had lived with them. I was raised by them to a degree. I never thought they would ever go away. Ever. But death is a, death is God's sobering reminder that we are not, like, we are not gods. We are finite and this slide toward death is nothing more than the outworking of God's judicial sentence. Believing that when you eat of this, or believing that when you eat of this, you will be like God's, but in reality, when you eat of it, you will certainly die. At the same time, we cry out against this limitation, not only because in our rebellion we still want to become God's, but because we have been made in the image of God. We are not mammals, we're not mere mammals, we are people. If we really believe that we are nothing more than accident, an accidental collection of atoms, moral outrage over anything would be irrational. People who believe in evolution have no grounds to be outraged over anything. No moral outrage should affect them or should be part of their life. But we want to live. That we are mammals means that our death has a physical side. That we are not merely mammals means that our death is God's determination to limit our arrogance. This means I am responsible. I am a responsible participant in my own death. Think of it that way. I am a responsible participant in my own death. Death is not simply something that happens to me. It happens to me because I am a sinner. In that sense, I have caused death. I am death's subject not just its object. In my transgression, I have attracted the just wrath of God. And that wrath is not mere outworking of impersonal principles, but God's personal and judicial reaction to the transgression in which I have responsibility or I have responsibly indulged in. I'm not saying it's wrong to rage against death or that Paul is wrong to treat death as the last enemy, 1 Corinthians 14. The Bible everywhere assumes that those who are bereaved will grieve and that their grief is never belittled. Job grieves unbearably at the loss of his children in Job 1 and Job 2. So does the widow of Nain who lost her son in Luke chapter 7. And she attracts Jesus' compassion and to our grieving minds, there seems some sort of inequity when wicked men live out their 70 years 
while little children perish. Again, we're reminded of Habakkuk. See how important Habakkuk is. Habakkuk has a great message for us. That little three chapter book. And it's essential that we understand the theological point that stands at the heart of our lostness and therefore our redemption. Death is finally the result of our sin and therefore rage directed against God as if he were unfair for passing the sentence that our sin deserved is inherently foolish. As foolish as criticizing a judge passing just sentence on a bank robber. Our rage is better directed at the ugliness of death, the wretchedness of sin. Never lose sight of the origins of death and therefore on this ground uh, rage against God himself. If we do lose sight of the origins of death, we would rage against God and that would be foolish. Second of all, and this is a quick one, Second of all, illness and death can be the immediate judicial consequence of a specific sin. It can be. This goes beyond anything that we've, that we've said, that we've stated in our little study here so far. We all sin, we all die. We are a race of sinners. We are a race of death. But in some instances, judicial sentence is executed immediately, immediately upon specific sin. And you can think of some of those. Just think about the Gospels. There is a 38-year-old paralysis, a 38-year-old man who is paralyzed in John chapter 5. There is uh, the leprosy of Gehazi in 2 Kings chapter 5. There are the deaths of Ananias and Sapphira. You know the leprosy of Gehazi? You remember that story? Gehazi lied to Elijah and so Elisha. Elisha says, well, the leprosy that left Naaman is now on you. There was immediate consequence for, for, the, um, for the specific sin. In 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 20 through 27, there was immediate reaction on Ananias and Sapphira. There was the painful reaction upon Herod. We alluded to that this morning in Acts chapter 12. The people looked at him as if he were a god. Evidently, in the heart of Herod, His pride swelled when he heard that. God knows his heart and God struck him with something immediately. There is the illness and the deaths of some members in the Corinthian congregation in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 and following. So the conclusion to be drawn is not that people who suffer in this way were the worst sinners of their times, Others have died of leprosy who had not sinned in the same manner that Gehazi did. And doubtless other people, uh, or others um, exhorted people or talked people into giving them money or they stole money. And they did these things in far more brutal ways, in far more deceitful ways than Ananias and Sapphira did. The conclusion, rather, is that sin merits such punishment. It is because of the Lord's mercies that we are not all instantly punished whenever we sin. If we were, the world would become a vast cemetery. None would be left to generate new human life, right? If the Lord punished us immediately for everything that we did, we wouldn't, we wouldn't make it past three years old. And that means that God does not owe anyone a civilized 70 years. It's a blessing. As the Old Testament portrays anyone who lives to an old age as a blessing. You're blessed if you're able to live to a ripe old age. And it is a blessing. It's still a blessing to be able to live to a ripe old age. Um, Third and last. Well... Okay, we'll pick up this because I have third, fourth, and fifth and the final thing before we go on to uh, talking about accepting death. So we'll stop right here. I'll dog ear my page, my notes. Um, 
And we'll pick up with this third. The third point here is illness and death are not necessarily the immediate judicial consequence of a specific sin. Well, you said, Pastor, the point before was that illness and death can be the immediate judicial consequence of a specific sin, and that's true. It can be. But it's not necessarily so. Sometimes Scripture tells us when it is, like Ananias and Sapphira, but in our life we have no idea. We have no idea. To, to presume, to know, to think, um, I've been sick for these past days because I have not handled a situation right. You, you, did you, you'd have to, God would have to tell you that. You just don't know whether that is true or not. So I hope this is helpful as we talk through some of these things. And I am very much enjoying this myself, running through this. So I hope it is a blessing for you as well.